This is a power distribution and fuse box and control box from out of a vehicle, a Nissan or Nissan to be precise. And I've already taken the back off this, and the reason, well, I'll show you. It's a circuit board in the back, but we'll take it apart further, right? I, I can get rid of this now. Excellent. This is so hard to get off. There's all these clips around the edge. You have to put shims in if you ever have to open this, which you may have to because uh, tracks like this, printed circuit board tracks, can blow if people put in the wrong size of fuses. And uh, it could be... The repair could be a blob of soda versus replacing the whole unit, and they're not cheap. But here we have uh, the layout with the relays mounted, the fuses mounted, and it appears the main power connection is here. It's the by far the biggest connectors. We've got the outputs via either fuses or the relays, but I'm wondering if these connectors here, and we could find out when we open it, are actually sort of low current data connectors either with canvas data or just direct control signals to the relay coils. Okay, the next bit of this is removing the circuit board from the back. I can see more clips around here. I think this is going to be tricky to remove. I'm going to have to remove all the fuses and relays in the front. That's going to take a moment, so I shall pause while I do that. So having tried getting these clips off, I then suddenly realized that once you've removed the relays and the fuses, the whole lot just drops out. <coughs> and we've got... A second, almost like a circuit board here, it's really important if you take this out that you don't uh, bend any of these pins because they have to be super precision aligned. And when you put this back on, it has to go down absolutely squarely down without any deviation of those contacts or it won't go over. So what do we have? Well, sadly, we do have active electronics here. We have a bus bar system, which is interesting. These little blades that are linking it. What's that about? What do they even tally up with on the, the cover? They're out of sight under there. They're actually hidden. They're just bridging sections of these bus bars together. I don't think they're fuses as such. They'd be very, very high power fuses. Are there any signs of fusing on here? Oh, there is a temperature sensor under there. What is that for? Is that a temperature sensor or a capacitor? It looks like a temperature sensor. It may be monitoring the temperature of the metalwork in here. Right, tell you what, I shall take it apart even further. One moment, please. Ah, there is more to this than meets the eye. Yes, it does have canvas. There's the microcontroller. I'll show you the picture of that circuit board. I didn't take a picture of the back because it's fiendishly difficult. If you were trying to service something on this, like, for instance, these hidden eight relays underneath that panel, and the regulator and its capacitor, then just folding this over, it looks like it's fairly, I mean, it's solid uh, pins. It didn't fold over easily. And really, there is the risk that even just trying to desolder a pin header this size, there is a risk that uh, you're going to damage the circuit board in the process. In a way, if you absolutely had to take that circuit board off, I'd almost suggest uh, cutting the pin header and then repairing it afterwards. Messy but perhaps the easiest option here. Oh, incidentally, they were hidden under a little plastic cover like this. And I'm not convinced. That I can see these relays have uh, diodes across the coils, but they're, they don't all seem to be controlled from this board. It looks as though there may be external input uh, for that. And these ones uh, just don't even have visible diodes. There is a little tiny spider. The spider is gone. Uh, this down here is a voltage regulator. I think it's a 5 volt regulator and we've got a little smoothing capacitor in a little housing next to it, which is nice. It keeps it away thermally as well as uh, physically supporting it. And it's mounted well up off the board. But anyway, let's take a look at this circuit board. I do get the feeling that a lot of the transistors in the back are for maybe buffering inputs, but it's hard to say without reverse engineering the whole thing. And that would be very time consuming. It would involve taking all this off. Um, other thing before I go any further with th th that is here are the fuse holders. They're literally just punched metal strips that the fuses are effectively jammed into from above when you have the case on. It's also worth mentioning that some are not necessarily connected to things you might... Uh, I mean, they're there, but they're shown as unused in the drawing. And it makes me think of that Eric O video where he had a problem 
and he was finding it very hard to trace. And it turned out, if I recall correctly, that someone had just filled a vacant position that wasn't supposed to have a fuse with a fuse, and in doing so had introduced a new problem. Weird, complicated things. Anyway, let's take a look at the, sh well, not the schematic, but we'll take a close look at the circuit board and see what's on it. So here is the main Yazaki microcontroller, an, NMS, an NMC302, not sure the numbers are under there. I didn't actually look the microcontroller up, but it will be a generic specialist application microcontroller. It has what looks like a 3.9 MHz crystal, but it also has a 32.768 frequency reference. Um, I'm guessing that's for real clock timing, but why would they have that in a fuse box? That's a bit weird, unless it is dealing with timing for the rest of the system. Maybe this has more control than you might think. Here is the CAN bus chip uh, with a filter here. This is two little inductors in it. And the CAN bus chip, let's see if i got a data sheet in that. Um, yes, I do. It's a PC A82C250, and it's a fairly generic um, CAN controller interface. This deals with uh, the two-way communication. The CAN bus is used primarily, well, I say it's used primarily, it was originally developed for the motor industry as a rugged, low-speed interface for communicating between control modules, but now it's used in elevators and factory equipment, it's used everywhere. And the theatre lights, you see the moving headlights, they have CAN bus communicating between the different modules. This chip here, made by Catalyst, is a, let me just grab the data sheet in that, in this case, it's the smallest they could offer. It's a um, E2 prom or EE prom electrically erasable programmable read only memory. Um, and this is the one kilobit version. Now, that's important, this chip, because it contains information about this whole module. It uh, tells the car when you plug it in what this module is, if it's the correct module for the car, and possibly, and this is the annoying bit, whether it's assigned to your vehicle. And you may find that if you just swapped another of those fuse boxes in, you might get errors. The check engine light might come on and it'll just warn you that there's something wrong. And in reality, it's because this unit wasn't programmed to your vehicle. And then you have to go to a dealer or a specialist automotive uh, operative like Keith DeFazio on YouTube or um, Keith Perkins, A1 Automotive Training, is it? Um, and they can uh, either transplant the chip, they can either program it in situ with the correct programmer uh, via one of those ports in the front, or you can actually transplant the chip from one unit into the other. But that is the key chip. That's containing the data. Now, on this subject, I have seen people reading the data off these chips by using a standard uh, EEPROM reader, and they hook one of these test clips onto the chip in circuit. I'm not convinced about that because I'm not sure I trust that for reliable reading or program of a chip. Because when you hook this on, you're also powering not just the uh, the micro the memory chip, but you're potentially powering the microcontroller as well. And the first thing a microcontroller does when it boots up is it sets the outputs and it might actually start trying to communicate with that chip. So unless you're reading data or programming in, in little pulses, but fast enough that the chip can't respond, then there's a possibility of a bus conflict and you could read garbled data off that. I'd rather just remove it from the circuit, but I could be wrong there. You guys can let me know if you've uh, used that technique and not had problems with it. But um, removing it, there's not too much in the vicinity. There's a few surface mount components, but they could be masked with a uh, captain tape, and then you could just use a heat gun and flux to heat up and then just swap the chip over, making sure that just, I mean, optionally, you could just store what's on this chip or just swap the chips over. This chip here is a watchdog and voltage monitor chip. It provides a nice clean reset if the power starts. If you disconnect the battery and the power starts going down to the point the microcontroller could get unstable, this will reset it. Also, it is a watchdog, which means this microcontroller has to keep going pulse, 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 and say, I'm awake, I'm awake, I'm awake. If it stops doing that, this will reset the chip just in case it uh, ends up in an unknown state. Anything else worth mentioning here? There are lots of diodes. I get the feeling that there is uh, that these transistors here may just be buffering their uh, inputs from the exterior, and it's got diode protection that as well. But I could be wrong here.
I would show you the other side, but it is just a bit of paper with printed with Kodak because I didn't take a picture of the other side owing to the fact that it was hard enough to bend it up at this angle and for reasons, I, I don't want to actually wreck this unit just in case it finds use to summon at some point in time. It would just feel like vandalism. That's assuming it's working. That little PTC thermistor down there is odd. I don't know. It's sandwiched up against the metal, so it's almost as if it's designed to detect an overheating bus bar. I wonder what that's for. Hmm. But that is it. This is why we have automotive specialists. This is why we have people like Eric O and others who understand that, you know, even something as simple as a fuse box is not simple, particularly when it's got a com computer in it and canvas communication. Oh, the, incidentally, this is not the last thing in the network here. I don't see any canvas termination resistors. So I'm going to guess that this is just looped in along the network here. I don't see any termination, unless it's another side. Is it on the other side? Could be on the other side. Oh, hold on. What do we have here? Oh, not sure. There might be. I didn't actually probe that out. It doesn't matter, though. It is just a thing. Canvas, uh, you've got the positive leg, you've got the negative leg, and normally they're relaxed and somewhere in the middle. And uh, any item, this or the computer that's controlling the whole car, the engine management system or other things, can actually pull those uh, up to actually to the rails to actually start communicating. It lets lots and lots of things communicate backwards and forwards in the one network with uh, bus control. Very interesting, complex network. But there we go. Uh, interesting, especially interesting, the construction of this with the way they've got the bus bars come in and they've got these links that are bridging sections together. I wonder why that is. Maybe there's an option for a fuse to control different sections of relays. You might have one fuse powering a number of uh, modules, a, a number of relays and outputs in one particular version of this board, but by taking this out, it can actually be con configured to actually power different ones. But there we have it. It's an interesting and strangely complex thing with a computer in it, not just a humble fuse box. So when you buy a replacement for your car, should you ever need one, and this was incidentally, one of these are, this type of unit can sometimes be mounted in the weirdest places, like behind a headlight where water can flood into that area. And uh, so this one is surprisingly clean. I do see a little bit of uh, the green crusties, as Erico says, on some of the blades here. But other than that, it's actually surprisingly dry. But if water does get into these, well, it's goodbye controller usually. It's usually so much damage that, uh, especially if it's in the circuit board, that you have to just get a new unit at ridiculous expense. But there we have it, the uh, the humble automotive fuse box. It's not quite as humble as it looks. <laughs>